So today we're going to be covering monetary policy. Monetary policy sounds a lot like money. Where is money held? Well, in a bank. The Bank of England are those who are responsible for setting monetary policy. And there are two things at their disposal that you need to know in your A-level spec. The first is that they can set interest rates. The second is that they can affect the money supply. And we'll deal with that in another video titled quantitative easing. Now, I'd like us to go through an essay. So the essay that I'd like to write down is as follows. Evaluate the macroeconomic effects of the Bank of England's decision to cut interest rates to 0.25% in August 2016. Now, if you ever look at the Marx scheme, it always has this concept known as a transmission mechanism. The transmission mechanism is just a fancy way of them saying, does the candidate go through the different components of aggregate demand? Do they take you through all the components and analyze what is happening to each of those components? Whenever you get a monetary policy essay, that in essence is your plan. So let's start right from the beginning. In the introduction, a very brief, basic definition. So the definition of monetary policy could be something along the lines of, Monetary policy is the manipulation of interest rates and the money supply in order to achieve macroeconomic objectives. Bear in mind that of the objectives, the Bank of England are responsible for trying to achieve the inflation target, which you all know is 2% plus or minus 1%. So that would be a nice introductory little paragraph, maybe talk about what the inflation rate is at, at that moment in time. I can't second guess what it will be at the time, but it's a good idea for you to know just before you go into your exam. Now, of the components of aggregate demand, we know that AD is composed of consumption, investment, government spending, and exports minus imports. The most significant component by quite a distance is consumption. Therefore, we're gonna give consumption the respect that it deserves. We are gonna analyze it not one way, not two ways, but three ways. If you can answer these three questions, you'll be able to write an effective and powerful opening paragraph about consumption. Question number one. When interest rates are low, are individuals more or less likely to save? Well, the answer to that is that they are less likely to save. And the rationale is simply this. When you go and put money in a bank, bear in mind that they don't just sit there waiting for you to come back. There isn't someone sort of squatting behind a cash point waiting for you to put in your pin and take out whatever you need to take out. You are essentially lending money to the bank when you put money in your account. In return for that, you get an interest rate often not significant, but an interest rate nonetheless. So in other words, when you put your money in the bank, you are lending money to them and in return getting an interest rate. Well, if interest rates are low, there isn't that much incentive for me to put that much money into my account because I'm not gonna get that much. So number one, savings are therefore gonna go down. And if savings go down, it must be that consumption is gonna go up. So that's question number one. Number two is in relation to credit cards. How does a credit card work? Well, let's say I spend some money on my credit card. That isn't my money. That is the bank's money or the credit card providers. In return, I get a slip at the end of the month which says, look, this is all the things that you bought on your credit card and they add interest at the end of it. In other words, I am borrowing money from the bank when I am using my credit card. Well, when interest rates are low, am I going to use my credit card more or less? You're gonna use it more because the amount that you have to pay back is less. The cost of borrowing has gone down and therefore credit purchases go up. So again, consumption up again. The third question is where you can really show off that you are an A-star candidate. It's in relation to mortgages. So before we ask the question, let's talk about what a mortgage is. Now at your age, I had no idea what a mortgage is. Simply put, it's something like this. Let's say that I find a property worth a million pounds. Very few people have a million pounds just lying around in their back pocket. It's not monopoly. So what I will do is I'll put down a deposit of about 20% of the value of that asset. So I'll put down 200,000 pounds. And then the bank will buy the remainder on my behalf. So that 800,000 pounds is paid for by the bank. I then pay this back over a duration of 20, 35 years. And every single month on top of it, I have to pay an interest. Now, what's more interesting for us is that there are two types of mortgages that you can take out. The first is simply called a fixed mortgage, where you pay a fixed percentage every single month, no matter what happens. The second is far more interesting for us. It's called a variable mortgage, otherwise known as a tracker mortgage. It's got both names. Now the name tracker is a bit of a giveaway because it essentially tracks the Bank of England interest rate so that if the Bank of England interest rate is high, you're paying back more on your tracker mortgage. If the Bank of England interest rate is low, you're paying less on your mortgage. So the third question in relation to consumption is simply this. Those individuals that have a variable mortgage, are they paying more or less on their mortgage? Well, with interest rates being low, they're paying less. 
Therefore, they have more disposable income left over, and as a consequence, they can spend more. Consumption, once again, goes up. You notice, by the way, that consumption went up for all three of the questions that we asked. That should always be the case. It should always be moving in the same direction. If that hasn't happened, you've probably done something wrong in your analysis. So, consumption, up. Second component of aggregate demand is investment. From now on, every single time you hear the word investment, I want you to think of an investor as someone that necessarily needs to borrow money from the bank in order to invest into things like capital machinery. Well, when interest rates are low, are they gonna borrow more or less? Well, the cost of borrowing is low, therefore they're likely to borrow more, invest more, and you can add that they're more likely to take risk because if it doesn't quite pay off, it's not the end of the world. I'm not paying back such an enormous interest rate. So we've got consumption going up, investment going up. The next component of aggregate demand is government spending. Now, what happens to government spending? The answer is nothing, nothing directly anyway. There might be an indirect impact, but nothing directly will happen to government spending. So you can kind of just ignore it. That leads us into X minus M, exports minus imports. And before we analyze what happens to exports and imports, we need to discuss a very important concept known as hot money. Hot money is the idea that if you're an international investor, you wanna put your money in bank accounts that give you the best rate of return. So hot money can either flow into an economy or it can flow out of an economy. Well, in this question, if interest rates are really low in the UK, is hot money gonna flow in or is it gonna flow out? Well, if I'm an investor, I probably don't have much incentive leaving my money in British bank accounts because the interest rate is ridiculously low. Therefore, hot money will flow out of the UK economy. Think about what happens then. So if I'm an investor, let's say I'm moving my money from the UK to the US. I am taking my pounds out of British bank accounts and I am converting them into dollars. In other words, I am selling my pounds in order to buy dollars. Now, if we draw a very simplistic supply and demand diagram illustrating the effects in the foreign exchange market, when there are more sellers of pounds, the supply curve simply shifts out. As a result of that, the value of the pound goes down. There's a very important concept here, which is that when the pound goes down and it's just naturally through supply and demand, this is a depreciation. The pound has depreciated as a result of money flowing out of the UK. Now, let's just quickly go on a quick tangent because I often find that with students, exports and imports, the current account is seen as like this horrible, intimidating, horrible thing. It really isn't that hard. The thing I always want you to remember is that there are two countries. There are two countries that export more than they import, but the reason behind why they export more than they import varies. So the first country, you may already have got it by now, is China. Why do people buy Chinese goods? Well, they buy Chinese goods because they're really, really cheap. In other words, China are price competitive. The second country that I was thinking of is Germany. Why do people buy German goods? Well, German goods are high quality. So in other words, you can either be price competitive or you can be quality competitive. So if we go back to our diagram, well, hot money's flown out of the UK economy. As a result, the pound is depreciated. Are we more or less price competitive? Well, given that the pound is now cheaper, we are more price competitive. So as a result of that, exports will go up. Think about why. Other currencies can now buy more pounds. If I have dollars, my dollars buy more pounds. So exports out of the UK will go up and imports coming in to the UK will go down because the pound cannot buy as many units from other, other parts of the world. So X goes up, M goes down. Now, you should all know that the UK has a deficit on its trade account, meaning that they import more than they export. If that's the case, is that getting better or is it getting worse now? When exports go up and imports go down, our deficit shrinks. So there is an improvement on the UK's current account. So let's recap. We've got consumption going up. We have investment going up. Exports minus imports as a whole is going up. So clearly aggregate demand is gonna be shifting outwards. Now at that point, it's very tempting for you to simply draw the diagram. But I want you to have a bonus analysis that enables you to then do a backup evaluation if you ever forget one of the evaluative points that we go through in this essay. The bonus analysis in is in relation to injections into the circular flow of income. You should all know from the circular flow of income that there are three injections. One, government spending. Two, investment. And three, exports. Whenever any of these go up, I want there to be an alarm in your head that goes, there's a bonus point here for me to talk about. And the bonus point is simply this. 
The injections into the circular flow of income would result in a positive multiplier effect. So in our question, investments and exports both went up. As a result, there is a positive multiplier effect. You should look at the video about multiplier effects to get a better understanding of what that is, but it's a very straightforward concept. Now, once we've talked about the multiplier effect, only now would I like you to draw me the diagram. So you would draw the Keynesian long run aggregate supply curve first, draw aggregate demand as always, and then shift it out. Now, you could actually shift it out twice if you wanted to, because the first shift is because consumption went up, investment went up, X minus M went up. The second shift is because there's a positive multiplier effect. Now, there's a key rule in economics, whether it's micro or macro. Every single time you draw a diagram, I always want you to talk about it. I want you to be able to comment on it. And the way that you often do that with macroeconomics is to talk about the macroeconomic objectives. So let's look at our diagram. What happened to economic growth? Well, economic growth went up from Y1 to Y3. One. Number two, what happened to unemployment? Well, unemployment falls because we're now closer to full capacity. Two. Number three, even though this isn't illustrated on the diagram, we talked about it as part of our essay. What happened to the current account? Well, there was an improvement on the UK's current account. So that's the third macroeconomic objective. The only bad thing that we can clearly say from the diagram is that there's inflation. Now, I don't want you to just say inflation, though. I always want you to specify the type of inflation that has occurred. Well, in this instance, the demand curve has shifted out and that caused inflation. In other words, we have demand pull inflation. That, in essence, is really strong analysis because you have gone through all the components of aggregate demand and analyzed them one step at a time, and you now show them that the macroeconomic objectives of economic growth, unemployment, current account, and inflation have all been impacted as a result of it. So now we can move over to some evaluative points. Evaluation number one. Now, let's say that I walk into the Bank of England and I go, hi, I'd like to get a loan. Am I gonna get a loan from the Bank of England? Um, no. The Bank of England only give lo loans to two entities. Number one is commercial banks, so HSBC, Barclays, Lloyds, any bank that you know. The second entity they give loans is to the government. So I cannot get a loan, no, no any business could get a loan from the Bank of England. Okay, so let's say I go to Barclays. I walk into Barclays and I'm like, hi, I'd like to get a loan of 0.25%. Am I likely to get a loan of 0.25%? Of course not. Why? Because if you're Barclays, if you borrow off the Bank of England at 0.25%, you want to make profit. So of course you're going to set a higher interest rate than 0.25%. Now, what's interesting about this is that every single bank sets their own interest rates. There is a difference between something called the base rate and interest rates. The base rate is what the central bank sets. So in our question, the Bank of England have set the base rate. That is 0.25%. The interest rates are what the commercial banks set. So let's say they're four, five percent, whatever it might be. Now, why is this significant? It is significant because unless the commercial banks also cut their interest rates when the Bank of England does, then it doesn't really have that big an impact on the economy. So the evaluator point is something along the lines of, however, there is no guarantee that the commercial banks will pass on the full benefits of the cut in the base rate to their customers in the form of lower interest rates. This actually happened, by the way, in 2009. So in the aftermath of the financial crash, the Bank of England interest rate at the time was 5%. They cut it down to 3% and then very quickly down to what was then a record low of 0.5%. Many of the commercial banks, though, didn't really alter their interest rates very much. That's a reflection of the fact that, look, it doesn't matter if the base rate is particularly low, it's all about what the commercial banks do to their interest rates. So that's a really important opening evaluative point that you can always throw in. Right, for those of you that are up to date with what's happening in the UK economy, if I were to ask you, what is the fiscal policy of the current government? Well, you've probably heard the word many times, not sure if you know what it means yet, but austerity. They are adopting a pro program of austerity. Austerity is a fancy way of basically saying big cuts to government spending. And we'll deal with that in another essay, but it's to do with the fact that the UK's fiscal deficit and national debt has got to the point where it is a little bit worrying. So they've been cutting spending. Now, with that in mind, government spending is also a component of aggregate demand. Okay, if that's the case, we just said that monetary policy is expansionary in the sense that AD is shifting outwards. But fiscal policy is contractionary. 
So they are kind of canceling each other out. That's a good point in and of itself. But I want to go one step further. I want to take it from what's a good point and make it an outstanding point. In order to do that, we can talk about current affairs. Now, very recently, the UK triggered Article 50, and we have decided to leave the EU. You're very lucky that this has happened simply because it's so easy for you to talk about in your essays, because there's so many points that develop on the back of Brexit. One of the points is this. Given that the UK is in the process of leaving the EU, do you think economic certainty or uncertainty is likely to be the kind of the play at the moment? Well, probably uncertainty. People aren't too sure about what's about to happen. That would therefore knock both consumer confidence and business confidence. So what would that do to consumption and investment? Well, we expect consumption therefore to potentially fall and investment to also fall. So now if you have government spending falling, consumption falling and investment falling, there is a danger that that could start to shift the aggregate demand curve for the UK economy inwards. And if that happens, we might be pushed into a recession. Even more problematic than a recession would be if the UK economy fell into deflation. Now, check out the video about deflation and why it's such a horrifyingly bad thing. But let's say the UK went into deflation. Well, you're now the governor of the Bank of England. Congratulations. You get to decide what the interest rate is for the UK economy. What are you going to do? Well, you need to inflate the economy. In other words, you need to shift aggregate demand outwards. What would you do to interest rates? You'd cut the interest rate, right? Well, what are interest rates at the moment? Interest rates in real life at the moment are 0.5%. In our question, 0.25%. They've raised it since, but 0.5. Is there much scope for you to cut interest rates? Not really. In other words, you are in big, big trouble if you are the UK. If you go into deflation, your monetary policy is already near the zero lower bound. You suffer from a liquidity trap. This is where further cuts to the interest rate have no bearing whatsoever on monetary policy, on the economy. Therefore, your hands are tied. It's a little bit like going all in when you play poker. You're just hoping for the best. But if we fell into deflation, the consequences of that would be calamitous because monetary policy would be completely ineffective. Now that is an outstanding evaluation to talk about the fact that by them having interest rates as low as they are, if we ever fell into deflation now, we're in big trouble because there's hardly anything that we could do to get out of it, at least from the monetary perspective. So that's two evaluations. Third evaluation. There are a couple of really generic, easy evaluative points that you could always throw in for a question like this. One of them that's always on the mark scheme is time lag. It takes approximately 18 to 24 months between a change in interest rates and it actually having an impact on the economy. Think about why. The reason is, is because people don't suddenly just adjust their spending habits. You can kind of throw in some concepts from theme one here, by the way, behavioral economics, in the sense that people exhibit habitual behavior. They are in the habit of doing something and they're unlikely to alter that behavior anytime soon. So even if interest rates go up, go down, I don't really change how much I spend and what I spend my money on. Therefore, you're not gonna see an impact on the economy for quite some time. And that is how you can answer a great monetary policy answer.